Today I'm going to shoot a video on a very special project piece. The knife is made by David Mirabli, but I want to give some backlog. I don't script my videos, so there's going to be some ums, there's going to be some stuttering back and forth trying to get my points across. I have two bull terriers wrestling right in front of me on the concrete, so if I seem to get a little distracted, um, I'll try to bring it all into a, a final point as the video goes along. First and foremost, um, as time goes on, I've always been the type of person that's looked for the best when it comes to quality kit, especially when it comes to home protection, self-protection, and basic survival in today's world. Whether it be a gun, a, fire, a knife, a sword, whatever I'm dealing with, I'm always trying to look for the, the highest level performance that I can find in a piece. This has brought me through years and years of different types of training through kendo, iedo, sparring with numerous different types of blade styles, trying to come up with what works for me as a personal protection and self-defense piece. We finally come to a time with shows like Forged and Fire where they're testing blades on ballistic, um, well not ballistic, basically anatomically correct gelatin um, torsos and things like that, where people are talking about how performance blades perform in actual situations where they could be used. Now, no, I'm no expert knife fighter. I'm not claiming to be. My experience comes through a lot of years of, like I said, kendo, iedo, and sparring with different types of training blades, but also more importantly, as a hunter. Um, as a hunter, I've seen the demise of, of many, many animals through bullets, uh, broadheads and arrows, and regretfully, blades when I'd have to finish animals up close and personal when things just didn't work out. So I, I do have a lot of, um, Basic, I got a bull terrier right here, hold on. Running around, this is what's running around me playing. Um, get out of here. I do have a lot of experience on how such, here, lady once picked up too, hold on. And this is lady, mm, go. I do have a lot of experience on how edge type tools such as broadheads work on animals. Um, this, has given me a lot of insight in what would work in the real world when it comes to self-defense and protection. Now, if you're unlimited, meaning you could carry any item you'd want, yes, a Bowie knife, a tomahawk, certain kukris, all make much better, much better edged weapon defense pieces. Uh, but we can't carry things like that these days. They're not concealable. They're too obtrusive. Everyone sees a big Bowie knife hanging on you, a big Kukri, a tomahawk. Um, my favorite fighting blade from, from the past is a large battlefield oriented Tonto. Um, a, a more wicked blade doesn't, doesn't exist. But that brings us to here where we cannot carry blades like that. We need to carry something more compact, something smaller, something five, five and a half inch blade is on the, on the larger thing. But again, what do those other tools, the tomahawk, the kukri, the buoy, and the big tonto have in common? And what they are is one strike devastating power. Meaning, in an edge altercation, you see a lot of stuff with reverse grips and the Cali stuff, that's awesome. And if you're a practitioner of that, awesome. Bottom line though is, you're slicing and dicing with an opponent, if it comes down to that, both usually end up very, very injured, dead. It's not something I'd ever want to think about doing, be rolling around with a box cutter with somebody. Where the Bowie knife, the big Tonto, the Tomahawk, and the Kukri have one big thing going, they are a one strike weapon. You catch somebody in the side of the head with a, a big Tonto, a Bowie knife, a Tomahawk, or a Kukri, it's lights out, it's over. You're gonna stop the aggressor right where he's at. You're not gonna have to um, hopefully do much more now, each of those weapons has its own problems. The Bowie knife and the Tonto are probably your two best because they're not so head heavy. A Tomahawk and a Kukri suffers the problem of overstrike. If you miss, you expose yourself and they're too hard to recover to come back again. The Bowie and the Tonto don't suffer that. But again, we're not talking about those type weapons. We're talking about something you can carry on you. And that's what's led me through years of trying to find what I think would be the ultimate self-defense protection oriented fighting knife. Now I hate to use the term fighting knife, but a knife you're carrying primarily for self-defense and protection 
is exactly that. It's a fighting knife. Um, tried Quakens over the years. They're wonderful stuff, but again, they don't pack a lot of power. Even through experience, I've driven broadheads on arrows, basically three, two, and four blade broadheads directly through the lungs of both lungs, popping both lungs through deer. Now, people are nowhere near as tough as a deer. And I think anybody that's ever hunted will tell you Bambi is a lot tougher than Rocco. Um, a deer, because of their, any kind of animal, because of their nature, is gonna have a survival instinct a lot stronger than most people. But the point is, when you kill a deer with a broadhead, you're basically suffocating them. You're shooting them through their lungs, and their lungs are filling up with blood, and basically, that's how you're killing the animal. But many deer I've shot, you shoot them with the, with the arrow, they can run 100, 200 yards before they die. Multiple seconds, minutes, a lot of time has passed. The same type of trauma that you'd induce with a blade, think about taking a sword, a rapier, and running it through a man, both his lungs. He's not just gonna fall over like in, the, in, in a cartoon. He's gonna stay alive for a minute. And in that time, he could do a lot of damage, kill you, injure you, hurt your family members, whatever the case may be, when it comes to edged defense and edged weapons, they're not sledgehammers. They're not, they, there is no real shocking power unless you go back to the big Tontos, Bowie knives, Kukris, and Tomahawks that deliver that one strike power. Even with a, a, a six inch, seven inch blade, if you thrust into a man's chest and pop a lung or even prick the heart, he's not just gonna fall over dead. He's still gonna have the mechanical power to keep moving for X amount of seconds or minutes, whatever it may be. But the point is, it's enough time that he could probably hurt you or one of your loved ones. So my quest was to find the most powerful, small, concealable, or portable type blade that I could carry to complement my sidearm, my pistol. Through those years of, of looking, I've tried a lot of great blades from a lot of great makers, but the inspiration for this came from a very obscure source. It came from a even a, a, a cheesy production folder, even though it's very well done, from Lynn Thompson of Cold Steel, and that's the Tal War. Now, I did a video on this knife. It's an interesting knife. And as folders go, within the world of the limitations of folders, this is a wicked little self-defense piece. The reason being, it's got a very scimitar-like blade that aids in, in, in what you'd call slashing. It's got this incredible ball on the end, which aids in striking. Now, again, this is a, I'll bet it's a very well done folder it's still a, a a folder and folders do have their limits so what i was looking for was something that was going to be hi baby that was going to be a little bit more sturdy a little bit larger and a lot more powerful and that and that brings me to the great david Mirabli. Now, David is an Alaskan bladesmith that is awesome. Lady wants to hang out with us while we talk. David is famous for just being the kind of guy that can really make, let's face it, a nasty weapon. Um, in the words of my buddy Sam Lurkin, who uses the word terrible to describe things that he really likes when it comes to combat blades, he says, oh, it's, it's a terrible blade, meaning it's terrifying is what he means. David is a, a, the kind of bladesmith that you could put him on a battlefield 500 years ago and he'd fit right in. He's a, a thick, burly guy with big hands and he understands edge geometry, balance, all the things that are really needed to make a high performance, self-defense, fighting, combat, whatever you want to call it. Dave Mirabli really is an artist when it comes to making martial blades. So I called my dear buddy up, told him what my ideas were, what I wanted, sent a, a, a towel war um, off to David, um, and um, David did his stuff. We had some parameters to stay within. David, of course, crushed it, always does. The name towel war is for a sword, 
that towel war is the word for a sword. And, and for years I thought, why would Lynn Thompson name a, a big folder a towel war? And in his cheesy description, he says, it's a pocket sword, it car it's a lot of power in a small piece. So I guess that's about the only um, sense it makes. If you look at the original knife, it looks more like, a, I believe it's a pesh kebab or, or one of those type designs from the Middle East. But he named it the Tau War. So we're not gonna call this a Tau War, we're just gonna call it something completely different we haven't figured it out yet. But what David's done and what he's really accomplished is making me, and I have a lot of custom blades from the finest makers out there. This blade truly impresses me. It literally, as Sam Lurkin says, is terrible. What we decided on doing was this would be David's first integral. If you're not familiar with an integral is, an integral is basically, you can do it either by machining it or forging it. David, of course, is a master that works in the medium of forging. The, the blade, the bolster, the hidden tang, all the way to the end is all forged and shaped out of one piece. He then adds handle scales, over wraps, etc., etc. So what David did is start out with one of my favorite, favorite mediums in Damascus, and that is Cable Damascus. Now, if you've never seen Cable Damascus, picture a big strand of cable steel that is hammered and forged and flipped and hammered and forged and flipped and cut apart and restacked in billets, then forged and flipped. And that's the way David does it. Most smiths just take it, they hammer it out, they hope all the cable ends weld together, they do some twisting, some flipping, and they, they keep moving that way. What you get when people do cable Damascus that way is inclusions or small voids in the steel that come out where you're basically having little pockets in the steel that don't weld. David's method, which is being very thorough of flipping and folding and flipping and folding and cutting into different pieces and putting back together, stacking and welding, really makes a blade that shows no inclusions. So David's method of forging his cable Damascus gives a, a very, very interesting piece that you just, I don't know if you can pick it out on the camera, I'll take better pictures. You get so many layers. All forge welded together, making pretty much a, 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 just a, a gorgeous pattern. Bill Bagwell calls his cable Damascus Satan's Lace. Just, it's one of my favorite Damascus um, styles, is cable Damascus. I found it makes a, an awesome, awesome piece. Very toothy edge, the edge usually gets from the cable. I don't know if it's because of all the micro layers, but it just seems to make a very aggressive, very sticky. When I say sticky, I mean cutting power just a nasty, aggressive cutter. Every cable piece that I've ever had from Michael Bell, Bill Bagwell have all been super aggressive cutters. David forged the whole piece. You can see the thickness in the bolster. Forged the whole piece out of a piece of cable from the bolster into the blade, into the upswept tip, into the, into the, the, the tang that tapers down to this big ball. Now what David did different than what was done on the production folder variant is, David made his ball bigger, the striking object. Um, I have bull terriers playing around the, the actual base. Get out of there guys, go. Of the camera, so they're gonna make it, the camera wiggle. So after David did all of, of, of his, his, his forging the shape, and I, I'll show some pictures of some of the different steps that he took to, to get to this point.
He then went into the handle scales. Now, one thing's great about David, if you send off and ask David to make you a knife, David's got big meaty hands and he really does know how to make a blade fit the hand extremely well. The balance of this piece is exceptional. This is the natural holding point of the blade right there, okay? Now, if you look at that blade, the way the sweep is right there, you see how it lies in the handle. Makes just for, when you go to, people can say, well, it doesn't have a guard. It doesn't need a guard. The way the handle's shaped, the wrap is so tacky, the extension you get when you come into this portion of it, I'll try to get in the camera right, that's your grip for a thrust. It's not going anywhere. It puts everything in line with your skeletal system for a big, hard thrust. This knife is a devastating thruster. What he's done to secure the grip is he started out by covering the integral tang with lightning strike carbon fiber from Matt Diskin. Which is just a, a fantastic carbon. Uh, it was all the rage for many years and it's still very popular. The supplies are getting very limited of it. From that, he laid in basically what the Japanese would call manuki, meaning small, pieces set under the under uh, the wrap for decoration but david's aren't for decoration david's again are made out of lightning strike carbon fiber you can see one right here another right here Now what these do is they give you a palm swell. So your hand fits in there super well and fills the hand out. Then he wraps it all. With carbon fiber Edo, the wrap. Now he didn't set these Manuki in positions for where the eye would find them appealing, he positioned them for where his hand would find them appealing. The way the swells were, whether you're holding it forehand or reverse grip, okay? They fit the hand perfectly and the swells are perfect. The wrap is exceedingly tight and literally like holding sandpaper in your hand. The grip is that aggressive. You could stick your hand in STP and still grab this blade and it would hang right in your hand. Now, that's the materials. Lightning strike carbon fiber, carbon fiber Edo wrap, and cable Damascus. But the magic comes in for the way he did it. The balance, the hand automatically goes to this position. It balances perfectly like that. It just lays right where the balance point is. Now in a large blade, I like my balance to be further out, maybe an inch into the blade. But in a small piece, there's a reason why I want it to balance here. The blade is extremely ductile. It's so quick that it, it, it's terrifying. Now let's explain the design features of this blade that Lynn kind of got really right with this production knife and David just nailed through the roof with his custom variant. First off, it's a fixed blade. Never, never do you think that a, a folder is necessarily the best combat blade. A lot of things can happen. They can't, they can not open. They can, if, whether they're waved, or automatic, There's, they're, they're wrought with problems that fixed blades really take out of the equation. But what David did, besides getting the balance correct, was everything he did, the way the bolster had Radical distal taper running into the blade has made the balance exceedingly well. Now what David's done, different from the production variant is, of course, the top clip is razor sharp. So now all of a sudden you have a, a sharpened talon, okay? The sweep of the blade is, as you can see, just perfect for long drawn out strokes for, for slashing. But more importantly, the butt. That big cable Damascus forge welded ball. Calm down, Maxi. This is a striking implement that is incredible. What's the matter guys, go play. Now what I mean by that is, yes, with a smaller blade you don't have the power to stop somebody with one slash or one stab. Yes, you can drive this home into somebody's chest, they're gonna stay alive long enough to do damage. The difference with this blade is the striking power of this butt. You hit somebody on the side of the head 
or strike them anywhere due to all the force going into a smaller surface area we all know um, like, like the way glass breakers work. The glass breaker focuses all the energy into a very small area and, and then therefore focuses the energy where it, 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 you get the most out of it. With this big striking ball, any type of smash you would do, this all of a sudden gives you the, 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 the power of, uh, of not as much per se of a tomahawk, but it, it amplifies what's in your hand to the point where you've got a wicked striking tool. So we'll go through the different things that make this blade what I believe to be the ideal self-defense fighting knife for me. Uh, first and foremost, the sweep of the blade. Excellent slasher. Secondly, the sharpened upswept of the blade. Just for grabbing someone, hooking behind their knee. If you hook behind somebody's knee and go to take them down by hooking by the knee and pulling, this is gonna incapacitate their entire whatever joint you're coming around and pulling, you're gonna bring it all the way in, cutting tendons, ligaments. Like Sam says, terrible. The handle, the way it curls, the way the, the, the Edo makes it for a sticky, almost sandpaper type grip, really giving you a linear thrust. The shape of the handle facilitates just a lot of different, a lot of different movement in the hand with a big steady grip. You can back cut with this blade like no other. Meaning when you, when you throw your jab and then end with a, a, a peel off this way, anything that the tip of this blade contacts coming that way out, it's gonna just snag and, 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 and I don't wanna say shred because the thing's razor sharp, slice. And also the most important feature, the power you can generate from the ball. This to me is the game changer on this blade. This is the piece of the design that gives you a tool and even in this in the world we live in the day maybe you're in a situation where a knife is warranted but you need to end the situation quickly a stab or a thrust is not going to do it unless you catch the throat and even then the person's going to have to bleed out the striking from the pommel could be a game changer and and really basically put the lights out on somebody and giving you the time to get away to protect yourself and or a family or love member. The blade transitions in the hand extremely well. Goes from reverse grip to forward grip very quickly. Again, indexes extremely well, exhibits incredible Upward strike slashing, downward thrust, hammer with the side, just an incredible amount of functional performance and ergonomics in this blade design. Really, really well done. So with all those different design elements, that's what I believe, for me, makes this blade just a real standout piece in my collection. Okay, no matter how many fantastic design elements are in this blade, it would all be for naught if it didn't have the correct sheath, or the, let's say the correct sheath system. For that, I always go to my dear friend Paul Long. Paul's probably the best leathersmith making knife sheaths on, in the country right now has been for years, he's well known in the custom world. Plus, Paul's a super dear friend of mine. A few years ago, Paul and I came up with a sheath design that is just, for me and the way I carry a blade, incredible. And again, you can have the best blade in the world, but if it's not in the right sheath package, it's a waste. This is what Paul and I came up with and Paul so gracefully executed. This one's made out of full cape buffalo skin. What you have is a pouch style sheath for this blade. Another reason why if this blade had a guard, it wouldn't be able to carry as well for me. Now, in days of old, I've, I've preached this for years, when men actually carried knives to put their life on and actually use, they all carried sh sash style. They didn't strap a knife down on their leg like this, flapping around. That's a purely Western thing that doesn't really work. And I especially love the ones with the, 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 the ties that you can tie the tip down against your thigh. 
try hiking with a big knife, slap around your thigh and then tie it to your thigh and see how that feels after a while. It's idiotic. Sash carry is anytime it's thrust through your belt in the Japanese culture, the obi, but it, it keeps the blade on the center line where your movement and everything doesn't affect it and it, it really is the, the best way to carry a fixed blade knife. I always carry a gun on my right side. I don't have one on today, but the gun is sitting right here that I, that I am carrying right now. Um, so I always carry on the weak side, my left side. This sheet design, very heavy duty pouch. Again, this is in Cape Buffalo leather. And what Paul does is he adds a strap here, simple strap with a stud here. Now what this does is, as you place the knife, if you want to carry it, say cross draw, you place it through your belt, bring down the strap and snap right there. Now the knife is basically set up for cross draw. You can sit in a car, you can do whatever you want. The knife is instantly accessible. I just bring in your left, remember, my right side's for my gun, by bringing your left hand down, grabbing the knife and drawing smooth. What this enables you to do is have incredible speed in your draw. If you need to draw, it's that quick. It literally, it's the fastest way to access a knife for me. The front cross draw is, is lightning quick and super comfortable in cars and everywhere else. You need to be more concealed, pop the strap, knife comes right out, drop the knife back into its pocket, then come behind your hip, through the belt, push down, boom. Now, the knife almost disappears. I don't know if you can see me. The knife's right here on my hip. If I have a suit jacket on, whatever I'm wearing, the knife's gone. I can even sit in a car this way and it does not bother me or get in the way. But the knife is veritably invisible when I'm standing there. And again, lightning quick. Lightning quick, it comes right up into your hand, right up into a natural fighting stance. And you've got a weapon that can cut on its way up because the curvature slash on its way down, strike wickedly with this focusing all its energy into the, into, the, into the ball. And again, pop it, comes right off again, feed the knife right back into the sheath. And again, super secure. The knife hangs upside down. It's just, it's for me, one of the most interesting, functional, and just well done when it comes to execution of any she system I've played with. Thank you, Paul Long. So basically guys, this to me is the culmination of a lot of years of, of edge weapon training, a fascination with edge weapons, real world, what works on living tissue and creatures. This is all the things that have been through my head trying to minimalize, instead of carrying a big Bowie knife or a Kukri or a big Tonto, trying to minimalize everything and get it down into a very carryable, powerful package. David Mirabli, uh, my brother from another mother, has executed everything that I could ever want. You know, I give David the ideas. I can't take credit for how David makes that work. I tell him what I want, what I'm looking for, what I, how I want it to perform, what I want it to do. David just has this awesome way of getting me. He's done that with so many projects and brought out such incredible work that I just can't, I love him, I can't thank him enough. David Mirabli of Alaska, in my mind, is one of the most high performance blade masters out there. Paul Long, of course, you're not gonna get better sheets than from Paul Long. Paul does everything from the fancy inlay overlay pieces to the most incredible utilitarian, wear like iron, last a lifetime sheets. Um, I can't take thank these two guys enough. And of course, for the inspiration, the Tao War from Lynn Thompson of Cold Steel. As crazy as he can be, and as nutty as some of his projects were, the guy put a lot of thought in a lot of his weapons. But again, he just knocked out of the park. Thanks for looking, appreciate it.